sorry we're just a couple of minutes delayed. Jim was doing an interview outside with one of our local <coughs> TV stations. Um, I should uh, just mention he insisted that they ask him a question about the connection between Mount Aloysius um, and the area that he is from um, in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, and he pointed out that our college was founded over 150 years ago by Sisters of Mercy, and the first school to educate young girls at the secondary school level had been founded since the Reformation, so 300 years, in Northern about those, that same amount of time when we were founded, was being founded right near Jim was raised, and in fact you have three nieces that have gone to that school, which is called Thornhill College. Thornhill College. Uh, it's kind of the sister school to St. Columns, which is where Jim went. Uh, so thank you, Jim. He insisted that that be put into that, that little TV interview, which was great. Let me do a very, very uh, quick, but I hope appropriate interview of, of Jim. First, uh, Jim Sharkey, Ambassador Jim Sharkey, um, um, has, really has a story about service. Um, he was Ireland's uh, ambassador for many years uh, on four continents. Uh, I counted over a dozen countries in which uh, Jim served. Um, um, and um, in some very difficult times, um, culminating with his service uh, to the Council of Europe, um, uh, where he played a very important role in what is essentially the human rights court for all of Europe, for all 47 nations that belong to it. So very much a story of service uh, to his home country. Um, Jim is also a story about talent. Um, he has so far lectured in four different classes here at the college on four completely different themes. He did a lecture on uh, literature and place, where he talked about the little community of his ancestors, which is called Inish Elwyn, the furthest north piece of Ireland. It's a little peninsula that hangs off of Donegal, where his mother's people are from. Great writers have come from there, including Ireland's leading living dramatist, uh, Brian Friel. Um, he did a lecture on violence as social disease um, in a political science history course uh, for Dr. Smith, um, on which I was able to collaborate at least a little bit with him, showing another side of his personality. He did a lecture um, in, in uh, Dr. Copley's class on Seamus Heaney, Ireland's Nobel Prize winning uh, poet, um, who was a, a close friend of Jim's and a schoolmate of Jim's. Um, and we'll do a little reading from Heaney um, at the very end. Um, that just begins to touch uh, the talents of the man. He has written in, in history. He's written in uh, literature um, in terms of this idea of literature and place, and of course in his own field of, of diplomacy. So many talents there. Thirdly, Jim's is a story that's a very Mount Aloysius story. Um, he was raised initially on the bog side of Derry, tough section of that community um, uh, and his uh, other part of his youth he spent in one of the most rural uh, parts of Ireland, way up on that northern coast uh, of Donegal. Um, he was the beneficiary of a major change in educational policy imposed uh, from Great Britain, uh, from England on Northern Ireland, which made it possible for young people of talent, regardless of their religion or economic circumstances, to be able to attend whatever school they qualify for. Jim happened to qualify for a school called St. Columns, um, a school at which, at the same time, Seamus Heaney uh, was a student who went on to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, John Hume was a student who won the Nobel Prize for Peace. Bishop Edward Daly, uh, one of the favorite um, um, clerics um, in all of, of at least recent Irish history, um, uh, famous musicians like Paul Brady um, and Phil Coulter um, um, and other uh, uh, leading uh, uh, people in the history of, of Northern Ireland, all at this one school, most of them enabled to attend that because of a change that made it possible for their education to be financed. So he has a long story of service. He has a very Mount Aloysius story. He has a story of many talents, but for nice pur tonight's purposes, um, he has a significant background in a part of the world that is much in the news today. Jim was, back in the 70s, Ireland's first emissary. He actually opened the initial embassy of Ireland, 
in what was the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the old USSR, which was a combination of many separate nations today. Uh, Jim's background in both his undergraduate and graduate work on Russia uh, best qualified him for that. So he was there before the breakup, and then Jim went back in 2002 um, as its ambassador, so he could really see all of the changes uh, in that 30-year period. Um, so he has great knowledge in an academic sense, but he has personal knowledge, um, having served on two different occasions um, as Ireland's first and then Ireland's highest emissary to that part of the world. So he has uh, very much inside knowledge on Russia, on the Ukraine, um, on many of the other nations uh, that now exist in that part of the world. And we asked Jim, since he was here as our visiting scholar for a month and we've asked him to do a lot of other things, would he mind sharing a few of his thoughts? Um, on the situation in the Ukraine, situation with Russia right now. And um, we're very grateful for his presence here tonight, and I give you Ambassador Jim Sharkey. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for those kind words. And before I start, just to draw your attention to the map, you can see um, Europe, and a lot of Eurasia and you can see just the sheer size and enormity of Russia. In fact, Russia continues on to here where my hand is and there are nine time zones in Russia. There are three in the United States and when the Soviet Union existed there were 11 time zones in the Soviet Union. So it's quite a big country the biggest in the world. But anyway, just to say that I'm delighted to be here, delighted to be here at Mount Aloysius College. I have, have a secret, and that is that I always wanted to be a teacher in a liberal arts college in the United States in a lovely part of America. And so my dream has come true, <laughs> thanks to Tom Foley. Um, we've been excited about coming here for some time. And since we were coming to America, sunny America, naturally we packed all our summer clothes. <laughs> we packed shorts and sunglasses and suntan lotion and sunblock. Um, and then when Michelle uh, Foley met us at the airport, I thought there was something funny or fishy because she was wearing one of these big anoraks <laughs> and fur boots. And then when we got um, into the car headed for Cresson, um, I knew that uh, we weren't going to Florida because <laughs> it started snowing and there was a blizzard on the way up. But we've been discovering this part of the world, Sadie and I. Um, we've discovered Evansburg and we've discovered Altoona, um, falling water, um, the Elk National Forest, um, Ray, Raystown, lovely Lakeland Raystown. And um, we found a lot of places with very familiar names. I mean, we could have breakfast in Derry, we could have lunch in Donegal, um, we could have supper in Uri, and that's not to mention Munster, and Arklow, and Wicklow, and, um, and you know, you can name it, they're all here, all 32 counties of Ireland. <laughs> but um, I'd like to talk about the crisis in Ukraine, Subject to one caveat, and that is that um, I'm not a practicing uh, diplomat anymore, so you're not going to get any secrets from me, so you shouldn't bet on the stock exchange from what you hear me say. Um, but I do think it's interesting the way in, in history um, and in current affairs, some names keep re repeating themselves. It's very unsettling. If you think of Sarajevo, the place where the first World War was triggered, and then during the 90s, and there's some people here who weren't born in the 90s, but during the 90s it was on the news. Um, Afghanistan, um, we think of the Northwest Frontier, when I was a kid reading comics and stories about the British, about British India, Irish regiments were always posted to India, because it was far away from Ireland. Um, British felt safer if they were in India. Um, and um, then, of course, the Russians came to grief in Afghanistan. 
And here in this school, believe it or not, I met a young girl who has been twice uh, to Afghanistan. I thought that was something very remarkable. And then this third place, Crimea. And um, we think of um, Florence Nightingale and the charge of the Light Brigade. Um, and near to me, in um, where my mother's grew up and so on in Ireland, there was an old guy whose father or his grandfather, I was never sure, had actually fought in the Crimea. And the grandfather of the father had got a pension. So this family had a house with slates on the roof. Everybody else had a thatched roof, but because of the pension, 10 pence a day or 10 pence a week, they actually had a slate roof. And he also knew a, a song about Crimea. And it went a bit like this. And when at Balaclava we landed quite sound, cold, cold, fierce, wet and hungry, we lay on the ground. Next morning for action, the bugle did call, and we had a fine breakfast of cannon and ball. Mm -hmm. um, we won at the Alma, likewise at Kerman, but the Russians, they wailed us upon the Redan. In scaling the walls there, I myself lost an eye, and a big Russian bullet, he always called them Russians, a big Russian bullet ran away with my thigh. Um, we always have to be very careful that history doesn't repeat itself. Um, that was uh, the Crimean War, as you know, was a war between the Russians on the one hand, and the French, the Turks, the British, and believe it or not, um, the Italians on the other side. And um, the, the effects of the defeat of Russia at that time, it was a near thing. And indeed, in many ways, it was a draw, but, but it wasn't a huge victory. So that was a defeat for the Russians. And it had consequences. One of them was the emancipation of the serfs in Russia. Um, the other was the growth of nationalism in the Russian zone, in Tsarist Russia, including the revolution in Poland in 1863, um, uh, the rise of nationalism in the Romanian parts of Russia, in Moldova, Moldavia, Valachia, and so on, and the rise of nationalism in Ukraine also. Now, I hope I don't offend anybody by saying that the immediate, the immediate origins of the current crisis in Ukraine are a tug of war, a high uh, risk, high stakes tug of war between the European Union on the one hand and the Russians on the other. Um, the European Union uh, was negotiating for Ukraine to become a member, or rather, I should be very careful, an associate member, associate member, not a full member of the European Union. And Russia and President Putin wanted Ukraine to become a member of a new Eurasian customs union. A customs union which he was founding together with Belarus, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. You can see Belarus formerly a part of the Soviet Union and Kazakhstan on this map. Um, now, in this tug of war, it seems to me, um, there was great risk because Ukraine, as we will discuss, um, is a hi highly fragile society um, with a deep fault line between East and West. And the Europeans, in engaging in this tug of war, it seems to me that some, so, somehow during that period, over the last year, all the strategic thinkers had, um, were on holiday or had gone off for sabbatical to university because it seemed to be managed at a technocratic level. And Russia has a deep, vital interest in the future of Ukraine, a real vital interest. And the Europeans have an interest in Ukraine, 
undoubtedly, um, and they would like to see Ukraine prosper. But you couldn't say that it was a really vital interest. So suddenly they were engaged in a tug of war where the opponent was disproportionate in his, the level of his commitment, the level of his energy, and the level of his determination and power. And as the American song says, something's got to give, something's got to give, something's got to give. And unfortunately, unfortunately, something gave in Ukraine. And I think um, in a strange way, you know, the leaders of, of the Western system, like, um, like uh, um, the German Prime Minister, and the British Prime Minister, the French President, and the American President woke up one morning and they found that suddenly President Putin was back from his great triumph in Sochi at the Winter Olympics. That he was suddenly micromanaging the situation in Ukraine. And, um, and Crimea slipped in a very short period of time out of Ukrainian sovereignty into Russian asserted sovereignty. Um, I was having coffee about six weeks ago before the Crimean crisis broke with a friend in Dublin. And this friend also takes an interest in Russia. And um, he was saying, you know, the difficulty is that um, if there's any risk of Ukraine becoming part of NATO, um, Putin will occupy Crimea, because the Russians have a big fleet there and so on. And I hadn't thought of it in those terms, but suddenly the minute he said it, it seemed crystal clear. And if two sort of amateurs sitting in a coffee shop in Dublin, 2,000 miles from Ukraine, could think in this way, then it seems to me quite incredible that the policy makers in Brussels weren't carefully calculating every minute and every movement of their strategy. I just can't understand it. All the more so I can't understand it, because if you think about it, it was very carefully and expeditiously executed by the Russians. It was executed by stealth with minimum, minimum loss of life and, um, and with maximum popular impact on Putin's point of view. So how that was missed, um, <coughs> I, really, I really don't know. Maybe I should say something, and I'd certainly like to, about the relationship between Russia and Ukraine historically. And um, today, of course, there are two separate countries. But modern Ukraine has a long history of formation with a very noble literature and culture. But as an independent country, or if, if even as a separate country, it only came into existence in the period after the second or the first world war with the collapse of the great empires on one side the austro-hungarian empire and on the other side the tsarist empire in russia it had a brief moment of glory um, but also lots of internal debate for several years when it existed uh, in its own right, but then both the Russians and I have to say the Poles uh, took it over, um, and um, and so that continued up until the outbreak of the Second World War. Now, in the um, Austro-Hungarian part of uh, Ukraine, um, uh, people were very westernized, 
Uh, they looked to Vienna. Uh, they looked also, I suppose, to Paris. Um, but, um, and from a religious point of view, they were Orthodox by and large, apart from Polish Catholics. But within the Orthodox tr tradition, there were two uh, varieties. One was the Greek Catholic tradition, and the other was the Russian Orthodox tradition. In, um, in Tsarist Ukraine, <coughs> if I may use that expression, um, Eastern Orthodoxy was very much the order of the day. And uh, according to the Slavonic rite, um, but also with all of the focus um, and, and, and Western suspicion of the, of the, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church. And also in Eastern Ukraine, uh, there were um, populations in cities like Kharkov and Donetsk and so on, uh, which were Russian or Russian speaking. So there was an historic fault line, it is perhaps even deeper roots in history than the Austro-Hungarians and the Tsars, but, um, but um, it's there and it helps to shape current events, at least to some extent. I don't want to oversimplify it. Now, what is the Russian historical connection with Ukraine? Why does Putin take these risks? Well, you could say that um, the history of Russia, of the modern state, begins in the territory we now call Ukraine. And we have to think of and the, uh, the movement of the Eastern Slavs from somewhere along here out in this direction. And the center of cultural life, the religious center of religious authority, um, the center of political influence um, for a long time until the 13th century was in Kiev. Um, in the uh, 13th century, in the middle of the 13th century, Kiev was razed to the ground by the Mongols, the famous Mongolian, um, Mongolian hordes. And in particular, um, one of the great centers of Mongol power uh, was in Crimea. Russia, or rather uh, Moscow, was also um, under threat of attack, and there was a movement of, um, great movement of uh, people of the Eastern Slavic tradition northwards, away from the Hordes. Um, but Moscow rose in prominence all of the time. It rose in importance, and at the fall of Constantinople, Moscow became the third Rome. Um, Rome in Italy, uh, Rome in Greece, and Rome in Moscow. And um, it had two driving elements. One was a very strong feeling against Islam. And if you look at Russian history, particularly over the last 500 years, you'll see that the Russians have spent a lot of their time and energy as a nation expanding into Islamic zones or Muslim zones or Turkish zones in Central Asia. So they were almost at permanent war with the Turks and with uh, people of Islamic origin. So that was one big drive. And the other big drive uh, was anti-Roman Catholicism. And um, the, uh, the Moscow uh, patriarch um, is historically um, the most anti-papist um, of them all, um, even Paisley, um, well, Paisley and the Patriarch of Moscow would probably be in the same boat on anti popery um, Another interesting aspect about the Ukrainian people is that unlike the Russians, they have been a people of emigration. And um, we, um, well, in the Austro-Hungarian section of the 19th and early 20th century, Ukraine, 
They emigrated uh, to Canada, huge Ukrainian population in Canada. They emigrated to Australia. They emigrated to Brazil and South America. And, um, and they even emigrated to Pennsylvania, as we see from the movie um, uh, uh, The Deer Hunter. And also, of course, the Ruthenian tradition is strong in Pennsylvania, uh, as we know from Andy Warhol. <laughs> now, the, those who lived in the Tsarist part of Ukraine were also great emigrants, and they moved also in great numbers. And for example, the colonization of Siberia um, was undertaken mostly by people of Ukrainian origin. And um, uh, also they settled in Kazakhstan, uh, but settled in Russia as well. And then, um, as well as that, there's another aspect, and that is it wasn't just voluntary emigration or voluntary movement for Ukrainians, because during the Stalinist period, there were savage deportations of people whom the Stalinists called Kulaks, and they were sent to Siberia. But all of those Ukrainians became Russified, or they became integrated in Russian society, and they began to speak Russian, um, aware of their Ukrainian heritage, but if you like, loyal to Russia. When I was in Russia, um, I often met Russians. Um, there were no real borders between, and maybe even today, no really strong borders between Russia and Ukraine. And you'd fre frequently meet Ukrainians who, whose mother came, or <coughs> Russians whose mother came from Ukraine, or whose wife came from Ukraine, or who had cousins um, living in Ukraine. Just let me have a quick glass of water. As President Foley said, I spent two periods in Russia. The first one was when I was, went to open the embassy in 1974, and the second one was when I went back as uh, ambassador. During the first time, Russia was one of two great superpowers in the world, the Soviet Union, and during the second time, the Soviet Union had collapsed. And during my first visit to Moscow, um, I was very much aware, as we all were, of the lethal power of the Soviet Union with a navy and an air force and an army and a missile system that could reach anywhere in the world. Um, the, uh, the first of May celebrations happened shortly after I arrived and in Stalin's time um, the uh, tanks and the planes and so on would go around in great circles so that the Western observers would count them twice and three times, and they would think there was far more than there really was. But in Brezhnev's time, and Brezhnev, by the way, was Ukrainian, in Brezhnev's time, um, there was no need to go around. They just had the sheer um, density of military capability. Shortly after we arrived as well, um, Nixon, uh, President Nixon paid a visit to Russia. And my wife jokes about this because we were staying in an hotel facing Red Square and, um, and suddenly there was a big knock on the door. I was at the embassy and my wife was in the, in the room with, um, with my kid and three Americans burst into the room with guns and they said, hey lady, sit over there, get away from the window. And her joke is always, she said, it must have been the end of the Soviet Union when American soldiers or American Secret Service agents with guns could tell you what to do in Red Square. <laughs> um, but um, it is true, when Nixon, uh, it is true that there were problems, despite all of that magnificent, if you like, uh, magnificent lethal artillery and capability, there were problems underneath. The leaders whom Nixon met um, 10 years later were still um, in charge of the country. 
Uh, when Nixon met them, they were old. So 10 years later, they were also a lot older. Um, things didn't change very much. There's a joke, which I'll tell you, about Stalin, Khrushchev, and um, Brezhnev having dinner in a train going across the steppes of Russia. And suddenly the train breaks down. And uh, maybe you've heard the joke before, but in any event, um, Stalin says, I'm going to solve this problem. So he goes outside and he ties a couple of people to the train and he gets a big whoop and beats them and they pull and pull and pull. And for a while the train goes, but then they get tired, flag out, and the train doesn't go anymore. And then Khrushchev says, leave this to me. So he gets a couple of bars of candy and he goes out and he gives them to the people who are pulling the train. And of course they eat the candy, they get strength, they like the candy, but after a while they get tired and uh, the train stops again. So Brezhnev, Khrushchev and Stalin are all there and they say to Brezhnev, what are you going to do? Well Brezhnev says, it's very simple. Let's eat our dinner and enjoy it. We pull down the curtains and we pretend that the train is going. <laughs> and in a way, that's how Russia worked. And um, there's a song by Johnny Cash, I don't know if you know it, the Detroit um, One Piece at a Time, by the fellow who builds a Cadillac. Mm -hmm. And except he's, he takes a bit every year. And it's all, when it's finally finished, it's a Cadillac, but it's like a Cadillac that no one has ever seen. And ordinary Russians survive by taking something home with them and then swapping. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, a suit of clothes uh, would have cost you a year's wages. I saw it hanging in the Goom store. Now, Goom is a big modern store in Moscow. But in those days, there was hardly anything in the Goom stores. And you could buy a sort of Al Capone 30 style suit mm -hmm. in 1974 for a year's wages. It would take 20 years, if you were lucky, to pay for a car. Um, you could get vodka in Russia, but you couldn't get beer. Um, you, if you were courting your girlfriend, you could give her chocolates, but you couldn't give her nylons or jeans. Um, you could um, have as much ice cream as you wanted, but you couldn't find ice. We, my wife went around Moscow for three hours one day looking for ice for a reception we were trying to give. And everything took a very long time. Everything took an extremely long time, unless there was a little sweetener that uh, made sure that the thing moved a bit quicker than before. And there were uh, some incidents. Um, there was the famous Fox Bad incident of a plane flying to um, Tokyo, and the Americans got a look inside and um, were shocked at how old-fashioned the technology was. There was the shooting down of the KAL plane. Remember the Korean airline plane that was shot down? and the Russian radar systems couldn't distinguish between a civilian plane and a military plane. And there were some people who knew that um, things had to change. Um, Reagan launched the great Star Wars campaign, uh, saying to the Russians, if you can keep up, keep up. But of course, technologically, although Star Wars was an invention, they couldn't keep up. And Yuri Andropov, who was the head of the KGB, tried to do something about it, and he brought forward a young man called Gorbachev, Mikhail Gorbachev. And uh, Gorbachev was a very decent character. He was a visionary. He wanted to change the whole system, but he was too late, um, just too late. And through his reforming process, the patient, Russia, had a cardiac arrest and it was put under intensive care and remained under intensive care for most of the 90s. <clears throat> that was um, the end of the Soviet Union. When I went back to Moscow, um, Putin <coughs> was in power in 2002. And Putin had been spotted by Yeltsin as a man who could do things, somebody who could do things. 
and it was true uh, Putin could do things, but he was also lucky. I mean, the bread and butter of Russia is the uh, price of oil. And Russia has um, extraordinary reserves of gas and energy. And in 1999, the price of oil per barrel, the world price, was $9. And every country that was producing oil was suffering. $9 a barrel. Uh, Norway was a deep crisis. But by 2002, uh, when uh, Putin was in power, the price of oil had gone up to $25 a barrel and still rising um, throughout the next decade. So Putin was able to pay for the pensions of the old people. And the position of old people in uh, Yeltsin's Russia was a terrible scandal. They were near uh, starvation, many of them. And uh, Putin was also able to pay uh, the salaries of teachers. He was able to pay uh, the salaries of soldiers. He was able to pay the salaries of civil servants. Um, he was able to close down the war in Chechnya in his own way, brutal way, but nonetheless did it. Um, he brought all of the wayward governors big personalities in different parts of Russia. He brought them under control. And he stopped this great area here, uh, Siberia, which is one of the richest areas in the world, um, from slipping away from the control of Moscow. Out here, there's only about 20 or 30 million people. And along uh, the Chinese border up here, there's less than 2 million people. And there's 200 million Chinese on the other side. Mm -hmm. So Putin reckoned also that Russia had to be strong. Um, and, and I often met people in Russia <coughs> thinking of the chaos and the desperation of the, the era of Yeltsin, uh, symbolized indeed by Yeltsin himself, who was frequently drunk in public some great adventure. He arrived in the plane in Ireland with left the Irish Prime Minister standing on the tarmac because he was, as we discovered later, but were too polite to say at the time, he was too drunk to get off the plane. But um, uh, Putin um, tried to put things back to work in Russia. Um, he gave faith and hope to Russian people. He gave them a sense of their pride back. Um, no country in the history of the world, no empire or superpower had ever declined so dramatically, had ever collapsed so dramatically as Russia. I mean, it collapsed territorially, economically, socially, ideologically, um, uh, constitutionally, uh, militarily, um, in the space of just a couple of years. And Russians felt a sense of powerlessness and misery um, following the collapse of Russia. So Putin, whether we like him or not, um, and that's a big question, um, whether we like him or not, he restored uh, the pride of ordinary people. Um, there were other disappointments as well. After the Cold War, you know, um, Russians thought that they would be integrated into the Western system like Poland, or like Hungary, or like uh, Romania. Um, it would have been a big job to integrate Russia, but, but in a way, you know, George Bush and Jim Baker, um, who managed that whole process very delicately, because of course there were nuclear weapons all around that territory, um, they probably thought of some process of integration as well. And maybe some of the Europeans thought of it. But as I say, it was a big task. And instead what the Russians saw, instead of integration, they saw um, NATO beginning to surround them. Now we may think that NATO is a nice alliance, friendly, um, you know, um, committed to democracy and human rights. But from a Russian point of view, you have to think of it a bit from a Russian point of view. Remember that historically, 
um, apart from the, Mon the Mongols, many of their enemies had come from the West. The Poles, the Lithuanians, the Swedes, the French, um, and on two occasions the Germans. And they saw NATO in the same uh, defense-centered way. They were preoccupied, worried, nervous. And you can't exaggerate that, I think. And also, um, you know, uh, George Bush Jr., if that's the right term, uh, George W. Bush, George W. Bush, um, he got on at the start very well with Putin. He looked into his eyes in Slovenia and saw his soul. Um, um, but, uh, and Putin thought that he'd got on well with Bush also. And during that, after the terrible events of 9-11, when the focus in America was on international terrorism and the war against terrorism and getting people to help you in that war, um, the, the um, Americans thought that the Russians, the Russian intelligence service, prompted by Putin, was the most helpful of them all. But then, as part of the war against uh, terrorism, and uh, as part of the war against the Taliban in Afghanistan, the Americans put an air base here in Kyrgyzstan, and they put another one in Uzbekistan. I don't know, I'm sure they were well-intentioned, but for the Russians, this merely reinforced the whole fear of encirclement. And behind the scenes, Putin worked with the leaders in Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan to get out the American bases. And in 2004 or 5, I think they, they, they did go. And, um, and in the same way, Putin has presented his position on, um, on Ukraine and on Crimea. Um, as a defense against NATO. Um, Russia trying to do its best to reduce the threat from outside. And of course, Crimea is an important, hugely important naval center for the Russians. Um, what is the Russian interest in Ukraine? Well, of course, uh, Putin is a risk taker, and um, he sniffs the level of opposition. He's trained as a KGB agent to do that, you could say. Um, and naturally, he doesn't think anything of, the, of, his, of what he's doing as wrong because he's a Russian patriot. Um, but um, I think, who knows really what his plans and strategy are. But if I was to speculate, I'd speculate along the following lines. His first priority, I think, his great priority, is to have Ukraine join his Eurasian alliance. And when Putin thinks of Ukraine, he doesn't think of Eastern Ukraine, he thinks of Ukraine. All Russians think of Ukraine in the way Ukrainians, or certainly Western Ukrainians, think of Ukraine as a single entity, virtually this country uh, here. And Ukraine is a very important country. 60% of its trade is with post-Soviet societies. And um, a lot of its uh, gas and energy, if not all of it, come from Russia. So there is a close relationship between Ukraine and Russia. And Putin knows that. And at times he has played the energy card, he's turned up the price or turned off the gas. Um, now, he's confronting a situation which I assume he is partly made, where there's great unrest in this part of Ukraine, in Kharkov and Donetsk, in the um, eastern parts. It's hard to know um, if given a free vote and a free referendum, 
how people in those parts whether they would vote for the EU at the moment or vote for the Eurasian Union. Um, but that's the way it is, we don't know. But there will be elections. And um, I don't think Putin wants to incorporate this area um, here into Russia. I'm not sure, but I don't think he does. Um, I mean, there is a possibility if things go badly wrong um, that this area could become a sort of Eastern Ukrainian Republic. Russia has managed <coughs> situations like that before. Um, for example, in Georgia, there are a number of pockets which are pro-Russian and keep the government in Tbilisi <coughs> under pressure. And in Moldavia, there, are, there is an area called the Transnistria Republic, and it keeps um, the government in Kisinau under pressure. But um, I'm not sure that, I mean, if that happens, I'm sure he'd be ready for it. But I think it's one of the worst case scenarios. At least I hope so. Um, I don't think military force, uh, Russia and Putin have not ruled out military force. Um, but that's a very, very high risk <coughs> option. Um, first of all, unless the Ukrainian army is completely useless um, or surrenders something unforeseen, um, then there would be clashes, there would be engagements, and there would be loss of life um, on both sides. So it would be no longer be a low cost operation. And the other thing is once you start a war, or once you go into a war, you have no idea how it's going to end up. So my hope is that um, Putin is really sort of playing a, a midterm game and he's telling us that you know we shouldn't get too uh, too um, ambitious in um, in um, in dealing with Ukraine in the West. Um, he's also hoping that he will have control to some extent over the constitutional process, which is be happening over the next six months or so in Ukraine. Um, I mean, he would like, assuming he wants to maintain more or less the current territorial integrity of Ukraine with the exception of Crimea, which is now part of Russia, whether we like it or not. Um, he will want a weak federal structure. Um, that is where, in particular, um, these states over here, or, or provinces, have veto rights on the future destiny of Ukraine. That's what I would assume. Um, and, um, and I would assume that what he wants is that this option of a Eurasian customs union should stay alive and that he would be moving Ukrainian opinion or he would at least continue to have the option of moving Ukrainian opinion in that direction. Um, the game he's playing, however, is a very high risk game. And as we see, things can go wrong, even um, though the Russians undoubtedly exercise influence, they don't control every single event. So we have had mayors being shot, and we have had OSC observers being kidnapped, and, um, and that's the risk. Uh, the best laid plans of mice and men, something terrible could go wrong. And I think the Americans are aware that you know, there is a risk involved. And I would imagine that their interest, right now at least, is to try and reduce the risk of something going wrong. Thank you very much indeed. Any questions? I have one, Jim. I don't want to.
please. Yeah. Um, would you uh, just talk a little bit uh, and maybe put your diplomat's hat on and talk about the position of the United States vis-a-vis uh, this Russia-Ukraine situation right now. What what are our interests? What, if anything, should do you think we should be doing? Well, um, I would have thought that um, the basic American interest in Central Europe um, is to maintain stability. And I would have thought their interest was also, um, until very recently, in maintaining the status quo. Um, I mean, if you think about it, um, Canada has a huge population of Ukrainians, which undoubtedly reflect on Canadian foreign policy. I don't think the same pressures domestically from um, from the Ukrainian community in the United States, I don't think that that is the same sort of weight to profoundly influence American foreign policy. But there are other things which influence it uh, domestically since the crisis has been gone. Um, Democrats versus Republicans. And of course, other lobbies such as Poles and Lithuanians as well. Um, now, the American area of vital interest, I would argue, of vital interest, is in East Asia. It's in the Asia-Pacific region. And I would also argue that um, Central Asia, at least until the crisis broke out, um, was not an area of vital American strategic concern, um, or Central Europe. Um, and that Ukraine was not an area of vital life and death American concern. Um, now that the crisis has, um, has occurred, um, there are pressures facing the United States. As I say, the domestic pressures are one. The second one is the sense of the United States as the world's superpower and policeman confronted with a crisis <coughs> that, uh, that, um, that could go wrong. Um, and um, also, um, as the world's superpower, maybe a sense of prestige and competition with Russia, because um, big boys like America don't like to be pushed. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I, th I think the Americans are also acting sensibly. Um, of course, as the head of NATO, they have to reassure their allies that they're aware of what's happening in Ukraine and that they're vigilant about uh, Russian intentions and um, the dangers from Putin. Force is not an option. It's certainly been ruled out uh, very, very clearly by the White House. Um, and that's another way of saying that, um, that um, this is not in itself a vital life and death American interest. Um, but the Americans will also be keeping a close eye on Putin um, um, because they don't want them interfering with any of these three countries here or um, with that country there. It's hard for them to do it because, of course, one of the great things that Poland has achieved um, since the, since the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall has been the reassurance of these two buffer states between it and one of its old enemies, Russia. But um, any miscalculation by the Russians here would be very serious because it would involve Article 5 commitments by the Americans. That is that NATO is obliged, that not just the Americans, but the French, the British, the Spanish, the Germans, are obliged to intervene. And I think uh, Putin knows that very well. He's not going to go that far in taking that risk. Um, so the dominant American objective is instability in uh, Central Europe. And I think the Americans also must know something else 
I mean, they must take this into account. I mean, if their real interests are engaged over here between China and Japan and so on, Korea, Taiwan, Hawaii, which is part of the United States, um, they were thinking about well, the Germans and the French and the British and the Poles and the Spanish. These are the European countries which are neighbors of um, Russia. So how do these countries evaluate the Russian threat? What price are they prepared to pay if they think the threat is a very serious threat? These countries are interdependent with Russia in trade, in investment, and in energy. So how much are they going to pay to um, tell Putin that he has to lay off? I imagine the Americans will be looking at that, and I think it would be right that they should look at that, because I think it would be wrong, my view, it would be wrong if the Americans became more European than the Europeans themselves. Obviously, they should support their European friends and allies, but they should not be out ahead of them. That's my view. I have a question. Your opinion of why Putin and Russia is no longer being rejuvenated isn't the fact that the American dollar for the last 50 to 100 years has set the world standard. Every country currency was compared to the American currency. Isn't it a fact that with our national debt rising as enormously as it is, these countries that you've just mentioned, Japan, Germany, France, so forth, if they start to use their currency as a standard, that lowers the American currency uh, down, of course, but uh, for American currency, for the debt, we can always print more money. But if these other countries start using their currency as the standard, isn't that going to create a problem? Yes. Uh, I, the, um, I mean, Japan is here and it has a, an exchangeable currency, very powerful Japan. currency, but linked to the dollar. The EU, including Ireland, has a currency, the euro, which is very strong, uh, but independent of the dollar, but still um, having a relationship with it. So there, the Russians have the ruble, but it is not an interchangeable, exchangeable currency. So there are three major interchangeable currencies. One is the Japanese yen, the other is the European euro, and the other one is the American dollar. Now, when I was in Moscow, it may have changed, and it's true that in the meantime, the Americans have borrowed, in effect, a lot of money from China. So China is one of the main uh, economic supporters of the United States, believe it or not. Uh, but when I was in Russia, it used to be said that there were more dollars under the bed in Russia than there were in circulation in the United States. <laughs> now, the amount of dollars in circulation in the United States as paper money has been declining, but the Russians were hoarding American dollars, and every Russian that could get their hands on American dollars um, would keep them. But um, I don't know if you're saying that the weakness of the dollar or the possible weakness of the dollar is a constraint on American freedom of action. Um, I'm not able really to totally evaluate that, but it is true probably that America, um, in terms of the resurgence of Russia and the rise of Japan, and not, well, not so much maybe Japan, although Japan is becoming very strong again, but the real rise of China, that America is correlatively not as strong as it was on the, when the Berlin Wall collapsed. And that's a limit on its freedom of maneuver. Yes? 
would the, are the interests of the Europeans uh, aligned? Uh, are there possible conflicts among them that might hamper a unified approach to Putin? Yeah, well, I, as I say, I'm not completely in the picture. Um, but the um, question is Poland. What is the Polish interest? I would imagine that the Polish interest in Ukraine must be very strong to maintain an independent Ukraine. And I'm not sure, I mean, I don't know if there, if there are polls in this audience, please tell me. But um, what I assume that the future of Ukraine is a vital interest for Poland. It's not a vital interest for Germany or France, but it is for Poland. And also, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, um, I assume that they want a strong, strident response to Russian behavior because they don't want the Russians taking any risk with their own new one independence. Um, however, the Germans now get their um, gas from Russia um, in a pipeline that jumps over the Baltic countries. So they get it independently. But they get their gas from Russia, a lot of it. Even some of that gas ends up in Ireland and England. Um, Russia just has tremendous gas reserves, um, as well as Kazakhstan, and as well as Azerbaijan, and as well as Turkmenistan. These poor countries down here, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan, God forgot about them, so they don't have it. But Kazakhstan, and Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, and Russia have God-given reserves. Um, so, you could imagine if there, whatever people say in public, when it comes to the extent of sanctions, there's going to be refinements, let me not say differences, but refinements in the position of different European countries. Some leaving, for example, the city of London um, is one of the main centers of the financial market in the world, in the world. And many Russians have put their money into projects in Britain and in the uh, financial centers of London. So if the, you're talking about financial um, targets, then the British will be sort of putting up their hand and saying, well, it shouldn't be disproportionately tough on us. And if you're talking about energy targets, the Germans will be putting up their hand and saying, it shouldn't be too tough on us. And everybody will have their own position. And to some extent, Putin senses those little creaks and cracks in the system, and he plays into them. Um, but um, we see. We see. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Uh, how would you best describe uh, public opinion in Russia regarding the government's actions in Crimea and the crisis in the Ukraine? Well, um, I would say that Putin's popularity maybe uh, improved because of Sochi. Mm -hmm. Put Putin's popularity had been going down. The popularity of anybody who stays in for too long mm -hmm. goes down. And Putin's popularity before the Olympic uh, Winter Olympics was going down. The Olympics gave a big boost. And then there was an issue raised by some of the opposition. There is an opposition in Russia. It's quite weak. I used to know some of them. But one of them it was a guy called Nemtsov. And he raised the expense. I can't remember. It was 50 billion it cost to uh, finance the uh, Winter Olympics. And where did the money go to? When you have big building projects, whether it's in Ireland or in Russia or in Philadelphia, um, and lots of money circling around, it falls over the top and it falls into people's pockets. That's one of the problems with construction as a way of financing economic growth. 
And, um, and so that was going to be an issue. But Putin came back, he came back from Sochi as the Ukraine crisis was building up and he took control. His popularity is greater than it has ever been. And um, Russians do not regard the uh, movement of Crimea into Russia as annexation. They regard it as a rightful act. They regard it as the return of Crimea to Russia because, of course, it was the Ukrainian. There are some people here as old as me. They may remember a, a head of Russia called Nikita Khrushchev. He was Ukrainian. And in 1964, he gave Crimea to Ukraine as a symbol of the intense and intimate friendship between the Russian and the Ukrainian peoples. So they also would think that Putin, the tough man, who takes off his clothes and rides bareback on horses and swims and fights alligators and uh, does all this really great macho stuff, they would have thought, well, that's a lot better than um, Yeltsin stumbling across the, the stage. But they also, uh, Russians have a great sense of humor. They're a very courageous people. They have a great uh, feeling for survival. Um, and they put up with a lot. Uh, but um, they probably think that the return of the Crimea and the, um, um, is really a justification for all of the humiliation that Russia suffered, as they see it, since the end of the Cold War. Remember that when, and I come back to them, George Bush Sr. and Jim Baker were very, very careful in their negotiation with Russia. Um, and um, they tried to make sure that it wasn't what's called a zero-sum game where nobody wins. But no sooner had you know, the nuclear weapons been taken away from Kazakhstan and Ukraine and other places, no sooner had the Soviet Union clearly ceased to exist and you began to hear voices in America saying, hey, look at us, we won the Cold War. So that was... Russians heard that and obviously felt a sense of shame and grief and Putin has restored some of their faith in Russia and in the future. Uh, what's your opinion on America really being involved as in Europe's in between America? Coming that way, Europe's in between America and Russia. Is it, is it anything to really do with America? Cause yeah, well that's they, a good they question. Invade, so they didn't um, only come here and not kill anyone. You know, let's say that last, I really wonder last, over the last year, what the Americans would have been thinking and saying and doing. Um, but once the crisis broke out, and particularly once the Crimea was annexed, then the Americans were drawn in inevitably. Um, because, you know, America has this sort of responsibility as a world power and policeman to engage. But if you look at what the Americans have been saying, John Kerry has been on the plane all the time trying to talk sense into Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, who by the way, you know, you have to be careful in Russia, the foreign ministry is probably not as powerful as the State Department in uh, the United States. So Lavrov, as a good diplomat, will agree things with Kerry, or half agree with him, but Putin may not endorse that completely. But um, the Americans are careful, I think, they've been very careful in their statements, particularly in their clear expression that force is ruled out, and in their uh, determination to work with their European allies, uh, not to get too far forward. And I think it would be a mistake for the Americans to get too far forward in a crisis where European interests, European interests are intimately involved. And as I say, where America's vital interests, in my view, are either on the American continent or in the Asia Pacific region. Because they said, if I, America, having these um, sanctions on Russia, 
that, that's fantastic, but I, I, you know, there's so many buildings in London that are Russian. I'm, like I can yeah, but I'm, and like I said Germany. So it's not just affecting America. It's literally affecting a whole continent by one nation's actions. So, so is it really a need of America, except for being the world political world well, it, The problem is that there are two drives of American foreign policy on this issue now. One drive of American foreign policy is that they have a certain status as a great power and domestically the White House will be pressed to exercise that status. So um, Obama can't turn around and say, hey, Ukraine is very far away because there will be a hundred people in the Congress who will jump up and say, hey, that's what we said about Hitler in Czechoslovakia. You know, this is appeasement. Um, you have to stop the dictator dead in his tracks. So Obama can't fall into the trap of being subject to that sort of criticism. And the second drive in American policy, as I say, is America has to reassure its allies um, that, um, that uh, America knows that there's something bad happening, because it's the head of the alliance. And maybe a third thing is, they have to keep an eye on things and engage to prevent things from going too far. So they have to, Putin may, might be involved in even greater risk taking if there wasn't a sort of American shadow over the whole thing. But it is true, American cannot go further than the Europeans. And as I said in reply to another question, the Europeans have their own reflections, whether it's the British on the role of Russian investment in the city of London, or whether it's the Germans and their dependence on energy, um, or the French and their investment in, in Russia, or the Italians who also are big importers of Russian gas. So everything is interconnected, intertwined. Yes? Uh, another question. Uh, I was just thinking uh, from my previous question, and this is kind of a follow-up, but I just want to see what your opinion is on it. Uh, could the increasing involvement of Russian interest in the Ukraine be an indicator of underlying domestic problems within uh, Russia itself? I think you can take that as uh, as read. To what extent now? I'm you know I, I'm not sure, but um, as I said, Putin's popularity is greater than ever before, um, and it was boosted by the. Um, the Winter Olympics in Sochi, but already there was questions he was going to have to face about the Winter Olympics. Um, the economy in Russia has slowed down quite a bit. The price of oil has fallen off its great high levels. I think at one stage, was it $110 a barrel? It's now down, what, $70, $80 a barrel? You may think that's nothing, but again, determine oil is a curse as well as a cure. And um, when it falls off in price, a lot of things go wrong. And also, Putin has been there a long time. As I say, the Russians, you know, I mean, he does look good uh, sitting on the back of a horse shooting tigers <laughs> in Siberia. <laughs> but maybe that's not what the Russians think they need. However, for the moment, he's back in charge. <laughs> he's back like Schwarzenegger. <laughs> well, Jim was also the ambassador to Italy. He was the number two guy in the American embassy. He was the ambassador to Japan, Australia. I think we can do a night on each one of those things. <laughs> Jim Sharkey was first uh, introduced to Mount Aloysius because he was one of eight at one time schoolboys who were profiled in a documentary called The Boys of St. Columns. And we had the Western Pennsylvania premiere of The Boys of St. Columns um, here at Mount Aloysius. As I mentioned earlier, one of the other Boys of St. Columns was Ireland's uh, recently deceased poet laureate, 
Nobel Prize winner, graduate of St. Columns, and friend of Jim's. Um, and I only discovered on this visit with Jim and Sadi um, that Chamisini wrote a poem about Jim um, on the occasion of Jim's being inducted as a distinguished alum of, of St. Columns. And with Jim's permission, uh, for the first time in Western Pennsylvania, um, I'd like to read this poem to everyone as a tribute to our speaker tonight. Um, it's by Seamus Heaney, and it's called Alumnus Illustrissimus. From Washington to far Japan, they honor noble Sharky-san. To Muscovites, he is the czar, the vodka, and the caviar. Ned Kelly to the crowd down under, to Danes the Thor of strength and thunder. From Inish Owen to Dublin Four, from Strasbourg to the Sicily shore, his hospitality and gumption, his ability to judge and function, and hold his own in all encounters with poets, politicians, punters, is legendary. We're proud of him. He does us proud. Here's to you, Jen. <laughs> Jim, I think you held your own in all encounters tonight with all the poets and politicians and punters here at Mount Aloysius. Thank you very much. Thank you.